think we'll just start right away, inshallah. Um, Dr. Ibrahim, the screen is yours. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa uthi rahmatillahi alameen and nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim amma ba'd. Today, inshallah, will be uh, uh, what do you call the, the last hadith according to uh, the compilation of Imam al nawawi Imam al nawawi uh, has written in his book 42 hadith. Uh, and uh, Ibn Rajab uh, came uh, and he made a commentary uh, of this uh, 42 hadith, but then he looked into the Sharia and uh, tried to see if there are any other hadith that fulfilled the conditions of Imam al nawawi so that he can include them in the in the in the in the book. So he added eight hadith to complete fifty. So and then he made the commentary of all the fifty hadith. Uh, he called the Jamal Ulum al Hikam. Uh, and uh, I've talked about this book uh, being uh, the best book I have ever seen uh, making commentary on this book of Imam An Nawawi. So today will be this hadith. Hadith is hadith number number forty two. So that's the end of what Imam Nawawi uh, has, uh, has chosen, and a very is a very excellent con uh, conclusion. In his Subhanallah, he started with the intention, which is supposed to be the beginning of every action. Because whatever you do in this life, if intention is not there, it will be useless. And also, he closed uh, the book with the istighfar hadith that talks about istighfar or going back to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in repentance. You know, as if he's telling you that you're going to have a lot of weaknesses in your life, in your approach, in your deed, and you shouldn't panic and you shouldn't worry so much. Allah SWT is the most merciful. As long as you are willing to come back to Allah SWT, you're always welcome. You know, dealing with Allah SWT is very interesting because you deal with human beings, you get tough life. But you go back to Allah SWT, you're always welcome. You know, you're always welcome. As long as it is not too late. And even the way Allah SWT made it too late, you know, if it happens in that way, definitely that person has no excuse at all. Because being too late is when you see the angel of death. You know, that's how Allah SWT make it. It's not that uh, he says if uh, some event happened, you know, uh, he made it in a way when you see the angel of death. And then Tawbah would not be accepted. Or you see the sun rising from the, from the, from the west. Or you meet Allah SWT on the day of judgment. So when the... <coughs> The sun rises from the west. This is also like death because you know by now that you're about to go to leave this life. The life is khalas finished. So all the chances that were given to you by Allah SWT, you have already burnt them completely. So nothing remained. So nobody will have excuse. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned when he says, لا أحد أحب إليه العذر من الله. There is nobody who loves excuse more than Allah SWT. He says, Min ajil rusula, mubashirin or mundirin. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he wants nobody to come and tell him, I did not get this, I did not get this. If I get this, if I, I am given this opportunity, you know, I will do this and that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cut off uh, these kind of excuses that might be placed by the creation on the day of judgment. Allah sent messengers and ambiya, you know not less than 124,000 prophets and messengers. Each and every one of them is coming to remind people with one thing, which is the ultimate cause and the reason why human beings succeed in this life. So if we understand the religion, we will see that, yes, Allah SWT really is the most merciful. And human beings have no excuse in this life because every single thing has been given in detail to us. And that's why he says, Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT praises himself, you know, because we don't understand what exactly Allah SWT has given us at, of a blessing. We don't appreciate it that much. So Allah praises himself and he, to, to remove the burden upon us, you know, because if, uh, if we are going to uh, be held responsible of doing it in the way Allah SWT is pleased, we might not be able to reach that moment uh, at that level. So just have a look at uh, the way Allah SWT selected those uh, special people to be sent to humankind for the purpose of reminder. Just look at that, you know. You will understand that, yes, there is nobody who deserves praise except Allah SWT. Because those ones Allah SWT did not just send anyone, you know, but he selected from them those people who can handle the message. That's why many of them have, uh, have been killed 
because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ka'ayyim min nabiyin qat aw qutila, you know. Yeah, you know, and there are some prophets of Allah SWT who are killed, some of them who are pressured, persecuted, but they never gave up, you know, and they're very merciful to that people, regardless of what they receive from uh, from them. You know, if Allah SWT is to choose somebody else, it's going to be tragedy because those ones will be impatient, you know, and people will be going to, to hell just like that. But he chose those people who he trained, you know, on patience, you know, and facing the hardship and thinking of nothing except how to carry their own nation to success, you know, subhanAllah. So that itself is, so is a blessing that needs from us appreciation and thanks, you know. And ap apart from that, he did not send them just like that because they will die like anybody else. In kamayitun wa inna humayitun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will die and they also will die. He is speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they are going to die. If they die, why do we get the legacy? What, what, what will be the reference? What I heard from somebody, I might forget it. That shall be something that I refer to from time to time. So Allah SWT accompany with them books, you know, which he preser preserved. Concerning the last one, he undertook the preservation of the book because there will be nobody to fix what uh, has, uh, I mean, what is uh, messed up by the people if, if it is to be destroyed. And uh, the previous book was supposed to be protected by their nations, by their people. But Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who handled the responsibility of taking care of it. And this is simply because there will be nobody who will come after that. You know, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell us this is wrong, this is right. He is the final messenger of Allah. So that book has to be preserved and protected. This itself is a ni'mah itself, you know, big, big, big ni'mah, you know. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, Alhamdulillah, ladhi anzala ala abdihi kitab. You know, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who revealed uh, the book, you know, to his slave, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why this deserve praise, you know? It really deserves it because this book is uh, the one that Allah SWT uses to take out many, you know, millions of people from the darkness of kufr to the light of iman. Many people from the darkness of fisk, you know, uh, evil deed and sins to the light of iman, you know, and righteousness. Many people are, have been taken by the Quran, you know, uh, from the darkness of depression and stress, you know, to the life of success and comfort in life. You know, so it's a guidance as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not there, but we have the book with us, which is uh, absolutely what can lead us to the right path and to the success in this life if we are truthful in our adherence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's just up to us to take it or to leave it. This is what makes it interesting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I mean, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah in us. You know, he gives you everything and then he like, the choice to you. He reminds you many times and he put inside you also, you know, your heart something that is reminding you. You know, it's very good in this life to find out that if somebody is going into the haram, they, they, they never relax from inside. You might see from their face that they, they, it's okay, but from inside they never relax. That's also a blessing from Allah SWT to have this because there are some people who are completely desensitized. They don't have this sense, you know, Allah SWT says, So he let them go deeper and deeper until they meet him with those uh, sins, and that will be the real tragedy. May Allah SWT grant us uh, good. So let's see this hadith. What does the Prophet mention in it? I just wanted us to understand how the scholars are designing their books. You know, they have intention you know, in everything. Imam Bukhari, when he started with the, 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 the hadith of intention, just like Imam An Nawawi. Bukhari came before Nawawi, so Imam Nawawi was imitating Bukhari. Bukhari also started with the book of uh, the Hadith of Intention. You know, Ibn Qudama started with the Hadith of Intention. Many people they started with the Hadith of Intention to remind themselves first and foremost, and to remind everyone that anything you do in this life, if this uh, action is not supported by good intention and sincerity in it, you will definitely be wrong in that action, and uh, staying away from it is better for you because it's either going to be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not just be uh, rejected by Allah, but it will be counted as shirk if you are intending somebody else, such as the dunya or whatever. And then the, when, they, when it comes to the conclusion, they will try to have a nice conclusion which will uh, act as a reflection for the, for the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the same thing, you know, started with knowledge, 
know, knowledge and, and knowing what to do and doing things accurately and also concluded with a strong reminder that this is the book that is given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is up to you to take it or to reject it but you should know that there will be a day which will be brought back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for accountability. Imam Bukhari, and this is Quran, the way it concluded. That's the last ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that uh, fear a day in which each and every one of you will be uh, taken back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will find that which you did in this life. So it, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that this is the book that have been given to you, it's up to you to take it or to reject it, but you should know that a day will come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you back to him for accountability. That's the Quran. Imam Bukhari, when he completed that, that his book, he completed it with a very nice hadith. Kalimatan khafifatan. Habibatan ila Rahman. Thaqilatan fil mizan. Khafifatan ala lisan. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah wa rafi. Subhanallah. You know, he says there are two words which are so light on the tongue, but so love, I mean, really loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah really loves them so much, but they are so light. You know, Thaqilatan fil mizan. And they are so heavy on the scale. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah wa rafi. You know, as these two words, you know, very nice conclusion. And he attached this, this nice conclusion with the hadith also that reminds about the akhirah, just like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. And right after the hadith, he concluded with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he's telling you that this is a solution. You know, you're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but since you are still living, this is a solution you have to make sure that the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is excellent. So uh, al Nawawi uh, quoted this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu qala samaytu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yaqul qala Allah Ta'ala ya ibn Adam innaka ma da'awtani wa rajawtani ghafartu laka ala ma kana minka wa la ubali ya ibn Adam law balaghat dhunubuka anan as-sama'i thumma istaghfartani ghafartu laka ya ibn Adam innaka law أتيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيئا لا أتيتك بقرابها مرفرة الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله هذا الحديث القدسي the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Allah سبحانه وتعالى said يا ابن آدم son of Adam Allah is calling the son of Adam that means you and I and everyone Allah سبحانه وتعالى call us and then uh, what is he inviting us for? To remind us about this excellent blessing and gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That help a believer not to worry so much in his life as long as he is observing this hadith. Ya ibn Adam, innaka ma da'awtani wa rajawtani ghafartu laka wa la ubali. Ala ma kana minka wa la ubali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma da'awtani wa rajawtani. You never invoke me and ask me. And at the same time, you're having a big hope that I will accept your invocation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ghaffarutu laka ala ma kana minka wa la ubayi. Allah akbar. And he, subhanallah, a Muslim, when he remembers that he has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his side, that brings relief to the heart. You know, that brings relief to the heart. And to be honest with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not disappoint people. As long as you're doing the correct thing, Allah doesn't disappoint. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a believer, when he asks for something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will be granted for sure either the thing he asked for or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep it for a better time. You know, sometimes you will be asking, you will be asking, you will be asking and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will delay it. And also in the delay, that is good. You know, but mostly we hasten and we don't understand. You know, but that is good. That is always good. Because the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delay, the more you insist because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, keep asking, keep asking. Allah really loves those people who are asking so much. That's why it is reported that some of the Salaf al-Salih used to say that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might delay the acceptance of the invocation of somebody, you know, because he wants him to keep mentioning those names that he attached 
his invocation with. You know, when you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you say, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. Allah loves to hear this. The more you say them, uh, the more you say them, uh, uh, the more you get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more you are saying, the more you are uh, getting reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, if, you, if you are... The more you say them, the more you get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the more you say, the more you get the word from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the delay is good for you. And at the end of the day, Allah is going to grant you that which you're asking for. And it, so that's a win-win situation. Dr. Ibrahim? Shaker Ibrahim, we lost your um, video feed. Suddenly. Disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was trying to say is uh, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might delay the acceptance. Uh, then we worry so much and uh, we hasten and we rush and it, so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had informed us in many places that that is good for us because we are going to increase in that kind of ibadah, asking, asking. The more you ask, the more reward you get. And at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa taala says He feels shy of seeing you raising up your hand, but at the same time, He lets you bring them down without accepting your invocation. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that one of the, the, the following things will take place. Either Allah SWT will grant you immediately what you have asked for. And for sure, you know, uh, 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 all of us have gone through this. You ask Allah SWT for something, but he got it on the spot. You know, so sometimes it's like that. You ask Allah right on the spot, and right on the spot, Allah SWT has granted you that. And sometimes you ask Allah SWT, you keep asking, ask, ask so many times, and Allah will not give he delays it until a better time for you, which you don't know. You know, you might be thinking that this is the best time because this is what you see physically. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ya'alamu wa antum la ta'alamu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, but you don't know. So if you have that trust on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chooses for you the, better, the best time for you to get that thing. So sometimes he would delay to the better time. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you what you are, what you're looking for. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not even give you that. Completely. You're asking for a car, you're asking for a house, you're asking for this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not grant you that which you're asking. Either because Allah knows this is bad for you when it comes to you. You don't know. Yeah. How many children, how many people have been crying, have been, uh, what do you call, uh, crying out, you know, complaining, you know, that they don't have children, they don't have children, you know. But then Allah wants to grant them a child that caused them a headache every single day. In a way, you see a father saying that if I know that this is what is going to happen, I would never ask him. When I was asking, I wasn't asking for this. But that was his problem because when he was asking, he was just asking Allah wants for a child. He should say, Allah, grant me the good one. So that means you're having a, col I, mean, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, a full version of dua with all the things that are supposed to protect that which is given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm saying this because we really need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we don't know. Allah knows the future. He knows what happens. So sometimes he will deprive you from that which you are asking for, but not because Allah doesn't want to give, but because Allah knows that this is not going to be good for you, either in your dunya or in your akhirah. Allah knows that it's not going to be good for you. So he protects you from that. But does that mean he will not give you anything else? No, he will replace you with something else. Either maghfirah, uh, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you something else, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expiate, I mean, will grant you uh, uh, a decrease in your sin, and in the hereafter, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removing all of your sins. Or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah will not even do that, will just 
I mean, jump to the conclusion and grant you Jannah because of this thing that you are asking for. That's the meaning of you will never raise up your hand and bring them down without getting something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't do that with his slaves. So dua is really essential in our life. It's one of the, 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 the easiest way to connect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah loves it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it. There are conditions to be fulfilled when you're asking uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, one of these conditions is to make sure that you don't eat haram. You know, eating haram is one of those uh, contributors to rejection of our invocations. So that's why monitoring our risk is really important to know where you're getting the risk and which kind, which, what type of risk you're getting is really important. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith that we studied long ago in this book, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, this person is uh, actually on a journey. This is one of the causes of acceptance. If you're on a journey, you're, you're expected to be in a state of difficulty. When you ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, you do is supposed to be heard. But this person is on a journey and he is using the tawassul by the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and he is raising up his hand. And you can see the nature of that person is the nature of somebody who is in need. But still the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, how is it possible for this person to get his invocation accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala while at the same time his food is haram, his drink is haram, and he has been fed by haram, by the, um, uh, fed with haram by his parents. You know? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Anna yusijabula. How is it possible for this person to get his dua being accepted? And one of these conditions is that, is that you shouldn't uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something that you know you shouldn't do. That's what we call exaggeration in the dua. You know that you shouldn't ask for this, but you ask for it. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to turn it into something which is not part of the human nature. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you to cut off your relationship between you and your relatives. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah will accept your invocation as long as you don't ask for a sin and you don't ask for something which contrib contribute uh, to the, uh, I mean, uh, 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 cutting off the ties between you and, you and your relatives. And on top of all, one of the conditions for the dua to be heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you should attach it with the tawassul, you know, tawassul means you mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the dua. You praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And secondly, you mention, you make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant somebody who is making dua without doing this. He said this dua is maktua. Maktua means deficient. It might be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the things, Allah ta'ala, once a person does them, inshallah, his dua will be heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when you do it. In, uh, in places where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, dua is expected to be accepted by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. One of these uh, places is the sujood, the time when you're making sujood. You know, usually we neglect this. You know, in most instances, we make dua after the prayer. And no problem, you make dua after the prayer, but you're losing a lot. The best time to make dua is when you are in, in the prayer. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the sujood, when you make dua, he said, definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, will listen to your dua. He said, definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to listen to your dua. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's one. And also the last part of the night, you know, the last part of the night, because this one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, he usually comes to the lowest level uh, of the heavens. And then he will be asking people, is there anyone who wants something? You know, subhanAllah. You know, you send angels with your dua, but now he came by himself asking you, what do you want? But you know, I'm telling you the truth. This is the best time for, for the body to, I mean, this is the best uh, time for sleeping, you know, according to the way we, we see it. So that's virtues. They come at this moment where it is very difficult so that we can, so that last matter would differentiate between the serious one and the lazy, lazy ones. So that's why it is my personal advice to myself first and foremost and everyone, that whenever you woke up at night, just like that, you woke up at night, don't go back to sleep without asking Allah SWT something. If you can stand up and go and pray two rakat and then go back to sleep, that would be excellent. And ask Allah SWT. And in my simple logic here is, how uh, you don't know why Allah SWT wake you up. And nights, nights they have hidden blessings which uh, only a few among us understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Mad'awtani wa rajawtani. 
غفرت لك على ما كان منك ولا أبالي. So Allah subhanahu wa taala says, as long as you call me and you ask me to forgive your sins and also you hope reward from me, Allah says, غفرت لك على ما كان منك ولا أبالي. Allah says, I'm going to forgive you whatever you do, you know, ولا أبالي. And I don't care. According to what you're doing and what you're looking for, Allah says, I will grant you that. ولا أبالي. And I don't care. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, I will forgive. And I don't care. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in that hadith, you know, a person committed sin and then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. And then later on, he committed again the sin. And then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sin. And then later on, he commit the sin again. And then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. Allah forgive the sin. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my slave realized that he has a Lord. You know, who forgives sins and also who hold people accountable of their mistakes. You know, he punished because of sins and he forgives sins. That's why he always come back to me to ask for forgiveness. I forgive him. Whatever he do, I forgive. Well, if al Masha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let him do, does whatever he wants. But this let him, I mean, uh, do whatever he wants. It doesn't mean that you should go. I mean, a person is now given a free ticket to do whatever he wants. No, Allah SWT is not talking about that. No. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that, I mean, Allah SWT, when he said that, he's talking about as long as a person, when he commits sin, he will come back to Allah SWT in repentance. You know, uh, let him continue with life like this. In other words, we are human beings. To live without committing sin, this is impossible. To have somebody who, is, who doesn't make a mistake in his life, this is impossible. So as such, we are going to be committing sin. So as long as we are committing sin and repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are on the safe side. We are on the safe side. But you know where the problem lies here? It's not about committing sin and repentance. Because if you are committing sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you the consciousness to repent, you are in a good shape. You Allah, you are in a good shape. You should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there are some who are 100, 100% you know, uh, desensitized. The, the sense is, is taken from them. You know. They don't have this consciousness. They get deeper and deeper and deeper in sense. That's another punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. But as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you that consciousness of repentance, you do the sin and you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are in a good uh, situation and a safe uh, uh, position. So the problem is not about committing the sin and repentance. The problem is about you being granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ability to remember repentance and repent on time. And the problem is, uh, is all about, you know, you being committing the sin, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel at the moment you are committing the sin to take off your life. So that's why a person should try his best and avoid the sin as much as he can. And they are going to come from time to time by mistake. This one, inshallah, as long as he repents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is okay. But intentional commission of a sin is very dangerous because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might shut down the life of a person at that moment when he is committing the sin. And that would be the real tragedy because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said everyone will be taken back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the way he, he died. <coughs> you die doing something, you will come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ لَمْ تُذْنِبُوا Okay, this is also another uh, hadith which is uh, uh, misunderstood by many of us. He said, لَوْ لَمْ تُذْنِبُوا لَذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ وَلَا أَتَى بِأُنَا سَنْيُذِبُونَ فَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ فَيَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, if, if, if you, you guys are not committing the sin, but then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not mention repentance here. That's why many are making mistakes. They said, you see, you know, the Prophet Allah said, if we don't commit sin, and uh, we will be destroyed by Allah. And this is very wrong. By Allah, this is absolutely wrong. And lack of understanding of the text. Because the Prophet Allah is speaking Arabic. And in Arabic, you have these uh, hidden things which are uh, hidden under a word or a sentence something uh, will be mentioned in the sentence which will be an indicator to that which is, which is, uh, uh, which is hidden. When he says, if, if you don't commit sin, 
Allah SWT would destroy you. The scholar said he meant if you don't commit sin and repent, then you will be destroyed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If you don't commit sin and repent, you will be destroyed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Which means if you are committing sin, and at the same time you quickly repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you will not be destroyed by Allah. Where do we get this repentance? Because in the second part of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah will destroy you, and He will bring others who will be committing sin and repenting, you know, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their sins and let them live. So this one also I brought it so that we can clear, have the clear understanding of this text, you know, not to be uh, uh, I mean, confused in the way other people are, are confused. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibn Adam, law balagat zunubu ka'ana na sama'i thumma staghfartani ghafartu laka wa la ubali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, son of Adam, if your sins, subhanAllah, this is really interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if your sins, you know, are at the same size of the anan sama anan sama is the, the sahab, the clouds. Some said anan sama means the, the heavens, you know, if the, the, the sins, I mean, fills the heavens completely. So if they are at the same size of the, the clouds, you can imagine how many sins are they, you know. It says, Allah says, Thumma staghfartan. And then you, you ask me to forgive you, you know, you repent. Allah says, Ghafaratu lak, I will definitely forgive. Allah, Allah Akbar. You know, sometimes you'll be asking, but how is it possible that some people, they are still going to hell? With all of this intensive amount of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how is it that we see some people going to hell? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Wallahi, this is uh, what I call, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withdraw, withdrawing from uh, his, I mean, supporting a person. And at the same time, the person forgets what benefits him, subhanAllah. So that's why the most important thing we should be busy with is to fix our relationship with him. Then he will fix every single thing we are doing in this, we are dealing with in this life. So he says, whatever sin you have, as long as you're asking Allah SWT to forgive, Allah will forgive you. Okay, there are many ways for a person to ask for the forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Number one is the dua you are making. Allahumma ghfirli. And you say, Allah, forgive me. Uh, forgive me. Or you say, Astaghfirullah. Allahumma ghfirli wa tuba alayhi inna kanta tawabul ghafur. Inna kanta tawabul rahim. Or tawabul ghafur. You know, any form of istighfar which is taken from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you do it, uh, Allah SWT will accept it from you. Or even in your language, whatever you say. You say in English, you say, Allah, forgive my sins. It works like that because Allah is the source of all languages. He understands what you're looking for. And he would definitely grant you what you say because he said, as long as you sincerely ask me to forgive, I will, I will, I will forgive you. So one of the, the means for the forgiveness is the, is, the, is the dua. And the dua together with the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely accept it. You know. One of the, 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 the I mean, the second uh, thing is the, the istighfar, you know, straightforward istighfar uh, that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prays so much in the Quran. You know, this istighfar, you know, has a lot of secret in it. So much secret in it, you know. And uh, to save time, I will invite you to read Surah Nuh. You know, Surah Nuh, uh, the second page when Nuh says, فَقُلْ تُسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا he, he, he reminded his people to engage in the istighfar, you know, because Allah SWT forgave the sins. And then he talked about the blessings and the benefits you get whenever you make istighfar to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And one of these causes of, uh, uh, of uh, forgiveness of the sins is the Tawheed, you know. And this is actually the greatest cause of the forgiveness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The, greater, the greatest cause is the Tawheed. One is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means you stay away from shirk because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says as long as a person is not committing shirk, the issue is simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive even without repentance on the day of judgment. If a person doesn't uh, do sin, there is a possibility. Uh, I'm sorry. If a person is not committing shirk, there is a possibility for him to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if he... Uh, did not manage to make istighfar in this in this life. So the greatest thing that a person should be busy with is the is the uh, observation of tawhid. 
And lastly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah said, Ya ibn Adam, inna ka lawd ataytani bi qurabi al-abdi khataya, thumma laqaytani la tushiriku bi shay'a, la ataytuka bi qurabi ha maghfiratan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, son of Adam, if you are to meet me on the day of judgment, bi qurabi al-abdi khataya, with the sin that is equivalent to the size of the sand. SubhanAllah. You know, he meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the sin which is similar to the size of the sand. You know, I don't know how to uh, calculate that, but you just go out of your house and pick up one hand of sand and see how to, to count it. How many thousand or millions of uh, particles or pieces of sand you're going to have in that, in that manner. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you are to meet me on the day of judgment with something similar to that, and then you meet me without associating partner with me, you are definitely going to meet somebody who will meet you with the same amount of maghfira. Subhanallah. You have billions of sins here. No matter how much big they are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will meet you on the day of judgment. If you repent, Allah will meet you with the same amount of of maghfira, with the same amount, but in, in terms of maghfira, forgiveness, subhanAllah. You have mil, one million sin, Allah will meet you with one million forgiveness. You know? And that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, and he says, those people who repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to turn their evil deed into righteous deed. Allah SWT will make the evil deed righteous deed. It's not the evil deed is going to be turned into righteous deed, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will remove the evil deed and replace them with the righteous one. Because when you repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the tawbah is going to be, uh, I mean, broken into pieces. You know, in the way each sin is going to be addressed by a tawbah. So every tawbah has a reward. So that's why you you will not be surprised when you see the person who has. One million sins, for instance, on the day of judgment, he will see one million reward being credited into his account, and he doesn't know where he, where did he get them? You know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, a person will be saying to Allah subhanahu wa taala, "How come I, I know I have been committing so, so many sins? I couldn't see them, and I see so many good deeds which I did not know. When did I do them?" You know, then Allah subhanahu wa taala will tell him, "This is your repentance. The impact of the repentance you have." So this is the uh, last hadith that you can see. Uh, as you can see, it's a very important hadith and a very important conclusion, which uh, reminds us about our weaknesses and also what to do to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to uh, go away from uh, these weaknesses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us uh, good and grant us ability to intensify our tawbah, especially in this month of uh, Ramadan. And uh, my advice to all of us is that this month of Ramadan, we should make it as if this is the last month you know, intensify your istighfar at least 100 times in a day. You know, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before Ramadan and after Ramadan, he used to do it like, uh, like this, not less than 70 times of istighfar. So this is our opportunity because you might easily get this, I mean, blessing by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, whereby he will tell the angels, he will ask them to write your name among those people who will never visit hell. And that will be the ultimate success we are waiting for. And after that, you know what will happen. Allah will put an eye of protection on your life. You will never go astray throughout your life until you meet him. So we can get this gift from this Ramadan. So we shouldn't take it lightly. We should take it a very serious matter. And we, we should be serious on this matter. Allah likes to see the heart uh, of, uh, of a person, I mean, like this, you know, being like this. You know, you're always serious when you invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you ask him, you're really serious. This is really what you're looking for. And these type of invocations and dua usually are not rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you will see it as somebody who believes that he cannot do without him. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And this is the reality. You can't do without him. So he wants you to confess because he's the only one who deserves this uh, kind of confession to be made uh, towards him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good and accept our, our tawbah and uh, make us uh, righteous and good people and uh, the people who will succeed in this month of Ramadan in the Hubikulli Jameel and Kafir. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallahu khairan, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, um, for all that input. Alhamdulillah.
Um, let's go straight to um, any possible questions there may be. Um, uh, are you able to? Yes, um, participants are able to unmute themselves and ask um, anything they want. Uh, you may also post your questions in the um, comments, if any. Okay, Alhamdulillah, it seems uh, quite comprehensive and quite clear today. So uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions. If there are any, you know, you can easily um, just cut me off. Okay. Um, uh, can I ask a simple question? Yeah, please. Just a simple one. Um, some of my students uh, always use these reasons not to submit assignment on time or quizzes on time. They would say that because I'm quite straight in the class, because if they submit late, for instance, then they, I deduct mark five marks. So they told me that I didn't have mercy. But then some students, <laughs> some students, when they say that, especially last semester, so that student told me that you, you don't have mercy. My other lecturers, I can submit late. So he submitted quite like, quite oh, honestly, first assignment, Submitted late for about like, you know, half of the day. The second assignments <laughs> submitted late for about like one week. And then the last assignments submitted one month after that. <laughs> so then he kept using the excuses because he was, I'm sorry to say this, uh, he was from IRK student doing minor in our department. So he said to me that, you know, um, all our lecturers are very kind, are very merciful because we adopt uh, like what you say that because there's always repentance and whatnot. So up to the point, because sometimes, you know, when you, like for me, I myself, of course, I don't have a lot of knowledge in terms of Islamic studies, so, but I know it is wrong. But then when this kind of student, you know, put all the, put all the um, arguments like that, then, you know, how would, you know, to tell them in the hikmah because of course, they would say that you don't, they don't say directly to me. Of course, impliedly, they would say that you don't study Islamic studies, so you don't understand the mercy. Could you hear me? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I was like, it was kind of funny last semester, but of course, I was furious also when I received that kind of statement. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Dr. Intern. Uh, these type of uh, people, <laughs> the best way to reply them is to say that, yes, uh, in the Sharia, uh, the scholars have mentioned that uh, when you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a way to do that. And dealing with human beings also has its own way. That's why they said uh, the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are based on forgiveness. And the rights of human beings are based on stinginess. You have to pay them their right. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive somebody else's right, but his is okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive. That's why sometimes mm -hmm. when there is a contradiction between the right of Allah and the right of human beings, mm. they, they, they go with the right of human beings, not because it is bigger than the right of Allah, but mm. because Allah forgives. Them. And the mm. human beings, uh, their rights should be, should be preserved. Mm. And, uh, and also... <clears throat> They said uh, that is that is, I will give you uh, uh, what do you call uh, a statement of a, a scholar who says mm. He says uh, if if somebody says that no, it should show mercy. It should tell mm. them that mercy has its own way <laughs> and has its own place. <laughs> and has its own place. You know, there is a place to show mercy and there is a place to show, uh, to, to be serious, you know. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, <clears throat> you, you talk to your children to stop doing something. You deprive them from something which they're interested in. Yes. You know, somebody might, they themselves also, they will say, you're so harsh. But yes. that's absolutely is a mercy because, you know, it will lead them to, to, to tragedy. If you yeah. were to be lenient, you know, they will, they will go astray. Yes. Rasulullah is the most merciful person amongst the human beings. Mm. But at the same time, he cut off the hand who's, of somebody who stole. You know? uh -uh. 
And he says, even if my daughter does that, I will, he stoned somebody who committed uh, adultery with Yaz So, uh, uh, you know, you can see how he placed things in their own places. Yeah, That's yeah, why yeah. they said wisdom is to put things in their own proper place. You know, uh, uh. It, to, to put things in their own proper place. If there is an appointment and agreement, if we are going to say that everyone can be negligent, just do it in the way you want, mm. you know, then the, uh, life will be so tough and and uh, we will never make an achievement, you know. Mm. And why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said we should keep our words, you know, and whenever we do something, we keep it. Uh, you agree that this is what you should be given to, you should be standing on this and this mm. word of your of your son. So mm. there is no justification at all that he, uh, for somebody to be late, you know, if he comes and apologize and be, bring some, uh, I, mean, I mean, ask for uh, something else, but not to say it in this way that you have to show mercy, but and somebody is doing, actually, this is accusation against those <laughs> <laughs> who are teaching him not to be responsible and keeping uh, things on, on, on time. You know? I don't mm. think if they themselves also, they hear him, they will agree with him, even if they do. I don't think they will be happy to hear him saying. <laughs> yeah, but he he replied that way to me, so that's why I'm I'm still wondering. So this is a good platform for me to ask because I think some other lecturers also face the same problem, which is to some extent funny, but to some extent it really take you know get into my nerves as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think yeah, we can. Just ask him to ask your cat if you're merciful or not. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, maybe um, I remember last time, uh, incidentally, you had mentioned this, but uh, perhaps I didn't catch it properly. You said there's certain hours um, of the night which, you know, have um, more baraka than, you know, others, right? And um, um, let's say from a Malaysian context, like which, what may be those hours and, you know, how can we capitalize on it? Um, is there any kind of a balance you use between prayers and asking for forgiveness and reading Quran, especially, especially during this month? I think it'd be very helpful for me, uh, for me personally. So, yeah. Yeah, the best is the last part of the night. If you divide the night into three parts, oh. starting from Maghrib. Maghrib now is around 7.30 or 7.20. So starting from the, that 7.20 until budget time, which is six, uh, exactly. So divide the night into three parts. The last third, you know, the last third, you know, is, is the best time for ibadat, for the prayer, for the dua, for everything. Because this is the time the Prophet Allah said, Allah SWT comes to the lowest level of the heavens and asks people, what exactly do you want? So the best thing to be done when a person, when a person wakes up is to pray. That's the best thing to start with. Make kudu and pray. And across the Fajr time, before Fajr, this, uh, this is the best time for istighfar. And your dua, if possible, your dua should be inside the prayer. Or at least if you cannot make it in Arabic, you know, uh, right after you finish two rakat, sit down and make long dua as much as you wish. Before you go to the next uh, prayer, you know, make a dua as long as you wish. No. But uh, when you're approaching Fajr, during the time we are making the sahur, this is the best time for istighfar. That's what Allah SWT says, uh, they, they sleep a little at night, and also in the, in the ashar, sahar is the time for the sahur, they engage themselves in doing istighfar. Allah SWT in another place says, well, He's praising the best people. He says, those ones are the ones who are making istighfar during the sahur time. So that means a very excellent thing to be done during the whole time a person to uh, be doing istighfar. And also logically you will understand it properly because you are not now about to begin a new day. Begin it with a fresh account, nothing, you know, you have already cleared all of your weaknesses and, and things. So now you have a fresh uh, thing to begin with. You know? so, so that's the best uh, thing to be done. Uh, a person should sleep and uh, wake up and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and make to a lot in the prayer or after the prayer, and then at, at last before Fajr, uh, during the time where we're taking the suhoor, a person should engage in istighfar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Allahumma kfirli, Allahumma kfirli. Oh, in your language, ya Allah forgive me, ya Allah forgive me, ya Allah forgive me. It's, it's okay, inshallah. Um, Dr. Ibrahim, <coughs> just now you mentioned yes, that uh, <laughs> um, 
you make doa if it's in our own language, we make it outside of our prayer. Yeah. Which means that we cannot make doa in our own language when we are making sujud. Yeah, the best is to avoid it. Uh, most of the scholars said it might invalidate the prayer when a person makes it in another language. Uh, they they permitted somebody who newly converted to Islam because you would, we don't expect him to learn the Arabic language in a moment. Uh, so uh, since prayer is very, very sensitive, especially the Wajib prayer, I really advise a person not to put any other language other than the Arabic. So what can I do if I have a lot of meat, and I do have, we take from those dua which is which are general dua of the Prophet Allah Muhammad, that a general can mean anything. So I know that I'm looking for, let's say, for a house, or I'm looking for money, or I'm looking for whatever. So okay. I, when I ask, I say, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana. When I mention the hasana, in my intention, I intended hasana to be that thing that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Allah knows what is in the heart, and be even like Allah, He will grant me. So I, yeah. I, I'm throwing two birds with uh, one stone. So first of all, I avoid the controversy of the scholars, and also I'm on the safe side. You know, and also my my need will be granted be even like Allah by Allah SWT because He knows what I'm looking for. Then after I finish the prayer, then I raise up my hand and I make a uh, dua. Uh, so that's in wajib prayer. In Sunnah prayers, also I would advise to avoid it. But Sunnah prayer is less sensitive than that than the wajib, because even uh, if uh, the Sunnah prayer is destroyed, uh, you just lost the reward, but you are not going to be uh, uh, getting sinned for losing the Sunnah prayers. But wajib, if you lost it, a person will get a sin, and uh, it will be required and until the day of judgment. He has to he has to pay it back. So that's the reason why I I, I pray for that we should stay away from any other language other than the Arabic language in the prayers. And if we want to do something, use this general dua by the Prophet Sallallahu which I guess everyone knows, like Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. Or as somebody who learned the Arabic language. If it is something that you can share with others, tell them that I want to ask this. How would I say in Arabic? They tell you, and then you read it in uh, in Arabic. In our, uh, try to memorize it before the prayer, or if you cannot memorize it, then keep the paper in your hand. You know, in the prayer when you're making the shahud, the last the shahud, have the paper on your on your on your on your hand or on the thigh, and then look at it and read the dua. That that also, inshallah, will be will be okay. Be the light Allah. Mm -hmm. What about if we uh, perform sujud, but then make doa in our heart? Is it possible also? Uh, the best is to use the tongue. Ah, so. But for sure, even if a person said in the heart, mm. Allah SWT knows, and He mm. knows that you are asking, be even like Allah, you will never lose it, inshallah. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. That, mm. that could be another alternative, be even like Allah. Ah, okay, thank you. I wanted to ask uh, exactly about this as well as you were saying it, like what Prof. Lama asked. Um, my, my thing is sometimes um, it will affect the quality of emotions that you can bring into your prayers, um, the language that you're using. For example, let's say I know what I want in my heart and I'm reading a dua, but then I'm not able to associate with those words the same way I would with maybe my, my, uh, my own words, my native language. And mm. it, it might mean it might make the difference between me crying and me not crying in my prayer, for example. So um, I, I just wanted to know, um, you know, your thoughts on that. Uh -uh. Yeah, that's why, that's why we just keep, you know, since dua is uh, unrestricted ibadah that you can do at any moment of your time, we should try to look into the sensitivity of what we're doing. You know? uh -huh. Let's say in the wajibat prayer, since it is a bit sensitive, we avoid our language. Mm. But for sure, making dua in your language where you can express yourself and have the strong feeling and attachment to that which you're asking for, this is far greater than using any other language where uh, your heart might not be connected to it. Mm. That's why Sheikh Lissam bin Taymiyyah even uh, was saying to the Arabs themselves, you know, because sometimes you try in a dua to maintain the grammars, the, you know, you say words correctly. If you go with the with the accents of the, the, the people in the road, you know, you'll be laughing at yourself, you know. <laughs> you know what are you asking for, you know? So, but even Tamiya says, no, you should just use your accent, you know, ask Allah, as long as there is no, uh, that, as long as it is not inappropriate, you should use that one because you feel it when you're asking and you know exactly what you're asking. 
Uh, he said, you shouldn't go with those grammar. You have to fix this. You have to do the fatah here, the kasra there. He said, this is uh -huh. wrong. Uh, because you'll be busy with that. And Allah doesn't want that. Allah wants your sincerity and your focus and your attention, you know, and, uh, and, and to, be, to, to, to know what exactly you're asking for. This is what Allah SWT wants. And usually when you say it in your language or in the accent you're familiar with, you'll be uh, able to pay attention that, that, that much. In a way, if you uh, say it in Arabic, the language, you might not uh, be able to do it correctly. And this is really a, uh, a, applicable and the advice to be given to those people who are going for Hajj. You see them a lot punishing themselves, pressuring themselves. They have to make dua in the Arabic and they don't even know what they're saying, many of them. That's very wrong. And I call it waste of time, waste of energy. You, know? you paid money a lot to go for Hajj you know, a lot of effort. And tawaf, you can even talk in it, you know. For sure, if you talk using your own language and asking Allah SWT, that would be greater than using any other thing which you don't even know what you're asking. Although Allah SWT knows, but Allah wants you to know what you're asking Him for. You know, otherwise it would be, uh, yeah, you, you're talking, you don't even know what you're, what you're saying, like your parents, you know. So <laughs> using our language and staying away from those books which have uh, been written by uh, other scholars, no matter whoever they are, you know. Because in Hajj and, uh, and Umrah, you don't have specific du'a said by the Prophet Sallallahu except one or two in Tawaf. And, and those one or two, they have their own specific place, you know, which you say them in a few seconds and you are done. The rest is all yours to choose any du'a you want. If you take a book written by Ibrahim, you know, uh, these are my feelings. How about yours? You know? These are things that I think they're good for me. I'm writing this book based on what I think is good. But how about yours? You have your own need, you know. So we should uh, really give this, uh, what do you call, our attention. You know, when making dua, uh, uh, the only person that you can take from him, you close your eyes, is the Prophet Sallallahu In his adiyah, inshallah, you will find something that fits your, your dua. And when you couldn't find something that, that fit uh, what you're looking for, then you go with your own dua in your own language. But uh, in the prayer, I really prefer we stay away from uh, controversy of the scholars. We be on the safe side. Mm. Oh. Even if you pray without making dua, it's better. At least the prayer is safe. And Allah knows what you're looking for. He will grant you that, even if you don't ask for it. Oh. So uh, to summarize, basically, um, when making dua, it's best that we you know, um, stick to the Arabic language. And um, I, I think... Maybe when we go out of our way to even translate our du'as into Arabic, I think that shows our intent and our commitment. And I think that will earn its own reward. Mm -hmm. And then um, outside that, perhaps maybe we can do a sujood. And then um, is, is that okay then? Like, um, I know. This, uh, making sujood separately for the du'a is innovation. Is, okay. Uh, wrong. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never made sujood to make du'a. I have seen many people, they make sujood when they want to make du'a. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. That is sujood is shukur. You know, sujood mm -hmm. for the yeah. shukur, you are, you are thanking Allah SWT for something he gave you. Uh, in that sujood, this one you can make any dua, but it has a cause. This happens when you receive a good news. Then you just mm -hmm. bow in where you are and ask Allah SWT and thank Allah and praise Allah SWT and ask for whatever you want in that. But just like this, I want to ask for something and then I bow for sujood. I ask Allah SWT in the sujood. This is not uh, what was done by Rasulullah SAW or any of his uh, companions, uh, to my knowledge. They just raise up their hand to the level of their chest and they ask, they ask. whatever they need. Mm. It's more than enough. Mm. Okay, Chala. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Is, are there any other questions before we break for prayers? Because it's already Asar. No. Everyone's okay. All right. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you for your time. Uh, obviously, you have a few things going on, especially in Ramadan. So we really appreciate that you're able to, you know, do this. Um, we all wish you, you know, uh, and each other, you know, uh, a very fruitful Ramadan. The rest of it, may we make the best of it. May our hearts awaken. May we be able to give, you know, the time at night, right, and sacrifice our sleep and our hunger for the sake of Allah. May our spirituality increase, inshallah, in this month. Inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.